This is Solo Travel Talk, the Japan series. Your solo travel advisor and host is Astrid Clements. And now we interrupt your regularly scheduled Japan themed solo travel talk program to share some exciting news from your solo travel advisor, Astrid Clements. Astrid has launched the Astrid Travel Club, and on this episode of Solo Travel Talk, Astrid will share the inspiration for the club, what the club offers, and how to know if membership is right for you. I'm podcast producer Catherine O'Brien. You love travel, Astrid has the flair. Let's see how these elements come together in the Astrid Travel Club. First off, Astrid, congratulations. I know you and the amazing Madeline have been working so hard behind the scenes to bring the Astrid Travel Club to fruition. Do you want to share with the listeners what the inspiration was for this club? Well, Catherine, thanks. Uh, yes, my fabulous, ultra cool <laughs> assistant, Madeline Ferret who actually works for Astrid Solo Travel Advisor, which is my website and my brand. And we have been literally laser focused on creating and launching the Astrid Travel Club for the last six months. We've brainstormed about, you know, how we want to differentiate ourselves and be authentic. We have talked to different travel professionals. We have talked to other solo travelers and tra- people who want to travel solo, but, uh, you know, have not done it yet. I mean, we have done, like I said, brainstorming, due diligence, everything to to create what we think will be an exciting new way for solo travelers who want to travel, but they don't want to travel totally alone. Mm which I will talk more about the concept of the club later. Now, you asked what the inspiration for the club was. And really, uh, there were several things that kind of uh, inspired me to actually do this. And I would say first, you know, for the last four years since I did launch Astrid Solo Travel Advisor, which is a website and a brand that focuses on affordable luxury ideas, products, and services specifically for the solo traveler. And if you're interested in this type of solo travel, just go to astridtravel.com and you'll see the blogs and the podcasts and the videos and now the Astrid Travel Club and the tours that we're going to offer with it. But People who started following me, they would ask me so many questions. And, and, you know, one of the things that I kept hearing is they loved these trips that I was going on and that I created for myself because they said, you just always seem to make all your destinations come alive. <laughs> you know, they were, they really, you know, I heard that more, uh, uh, I heard that over and over. And then about three years ago, um, the director of the Greater Baton Rouge Arts Council came to me. I had been uh, a board member on the Arts Council about 25 years ago for many years, and we've known each other in and out of different arts organizations in my city, Baton Rouge. And she came to me and she said, Astrid, I want to create a, a program called Art Routes. And it's kind of like There were other arts councils and arts groups that were doing this around the country, but it was a a program or initiative where you took other people who were involved in cultural development from your communities, and you would travel to other cities to see what they were doing Mm. or to experience their culture and how their arts and cultural community basically thrived. And so she said, you know, I would like to to create an initiative like that for uh, some of our donors and, and also maybe even an artist that didn't have the ability to travel and, you know, we would basically uh, underwrite their trip. So, you know, I told her, of course I would do this, even though I'd never put a trip together for anybody <laughs> except myself, uh, much less a whole group. So I did it, and we had two really successful trips. We went, first of all, to St. Petersburg, 
And uh, that particular trip, I think I called it uh, uh, St. Petersburg, the cultural capital of Russia. But that trip I focused or we focused on uh, classical dance because the uh, executive director of the Arts Council had been a ballerina. And I have very good uh, relationships and contacts in Russia. And I thought, I know I can make this trip really fantastic with the Hermitage Museum and all the different art venues, the galleries, et cetera, the ballet, the beautiful old palaces and, and vill- not villas, but uh, man, you know, inner city mansions. Even the food now is getting so much better in Russia and uh, several uh, hotels that I knew that I had stayed in that I thought was fabulous. So I said, I can do this. We can go to St. Petersburg. So I created this trip. And if you want to know all about it, it's on the website. You can click down uh, under the Astrid Travel Club tab. And also for devotees of Solo Travel Talk, we actually interviewed Renee and had a whole episode about St. Petersburg, the Art, Root, Art Roots Tour. Yeah, and, and it was it's a great tour. And I'm going to be doing that tour again for the Astrid Travel Club probably once a year because, you know, one of the some of the specialty things we did is we we had dinner with a, a prima ballerina. And I mean, ballerinas are like the movie stars of Russia. They're, they're cultural, uh, treasures. So to have dinner with a ballerina and, and to listen to her about her life. I mean, she's, ma- she was married. How difficult it was for her to decide she was going to have children. Because usually when the ballerinas have children, they become teachers. They can't dance really anymore on the level that they need to. But she did. She had two children, and she was still dancing. And she she was probably hmm, approaching 40, and she shared with us she wanted to dance till she couldn't dance anymore. But how difficult it was to keep everything in balance. It was just a beautiful evening, and she shared a lot about male ballet dancers too and how they are so uh, they marry and they are so loved too i mean you know i i guess it, coming from the west maybe i just wasn't that educated but but it really opened up to us a lot of things that made you appreciate it even more then to even start the trip the first activity we did we had a curator from the hermitage museum Give us an introduction to Russian ballet, the history of it, how to watch a ballet, what the different parts of a ballet are and and the meaning of them and how it's different from French ballet mm. and, and uh, Western ballet, you know, American ballet. And even from the old costumes and how they've changed and how they wear certain tutus there and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was just, this whole trip was, you know, and you can listen to the whole podcast about it. I won't go on that. But it was a great success. So they wanted to go somewhere else. So I decided that, well, we we definitely don't want to go as far away as we did on the first trip. So we keyed in, or I keyed in on San Miguel de Allende in Mexico because it has a thriving arts community there, especially in the visual arts, lots of galleries, lots of arts and crafts. And they have a strong still what's called Mesoamerican culture. And in that culture, they've got a lot of strong spirituality that dates back to Well, they have pyramids in the area. And it's just, it's a place where uh, there's a lot of levels of of consciousness that are there. And it's a beautiful city. Uh, It's very walkable. And it's upscale because there's lots of expats that live there. It actually was first, the expansion of the city was started by an expat community of artists. Mm. So it really has an arts focus. So our second trip was there. We did a lot of cool things, and we did a podcast on that, too, and it's on the web, my website. 
astridtravel.com, and you can read all about it. So from those two trips, and I put them together, and they were so well-received, and I started to kind of think about it more because people were saying, oh, Astrid, you know, you should do this. And I said, well, I don't want to be a tour guide. I mean, I'm not a travel agent. I, I like to see the big big picture, help people, facilitate people to do things on their own in terms of how they're traveling and traveling solo and, and to share my ideas and, and this kind of thing. But I kept hearing it. Then the last thing that was my inspiration is I had a friend of mine that I had been friends with for about 35 years. Don't really see her on a regular basis. But we were, we go back to, a, to college, really, to tell you the truth. But we were in a book club together. And, I mean, you know, she's kind of always goes in and out of my orbit in some way. Well, she she emailed me. She said, oh, Astrid, I'll pay you. What, what we need you to do is I have a group of women, and we want to go to San Miguel in Mexico City. But some of them are scared about this, or some of them are not sure, and we want to we want to try to figure out exactly what we want to do. So we want to take you out to lunch and pick your brain. So I told her, I said, of course, Joel, and I said I'd be happy to do it. So we had this great lunch. They asked me all these questions and everything, and they were all excited. And I think I relieved most of every objection or fear. And Joellen, Joellen, at the end of the of the lunch, she said, Astrid, you need to start a travel club and we'll have <laughs> meetings and we'll talk about things and we'll plan trips and everything. And really, that comment, the way she said it, that uh, that uh, that lunch was my sign. Mm. And because I kept hearing it and I thought, you know, I have developed so many great contacts through all my travels, whether they're travel professionals or private guides or contacts and embassies. I mean, I don't just go to a place. I get down (laughs) and I try to do it. I really tried to experience the whole ethos of a place. So I'm not just doing a few things. And because of that, I've met a lot of interesting people who I can call and pick up, you know. And when I stay at a hotel, if I really like it, I try to talk to the owner, if it's whatever, or the manager, and and find out why this, you know, what's the magic behind here. I can feel it. I see it. I know what it is. But, you know, where is it coming from? That's really the inspiration. And I, I would have to say that, you know, the inspiration for the Travel Club came from other people mm. who liked or were inspired by the types of travel experiences I shared on my website and, of course, on social media and on this podcast, Solo Travel Talk. So that's the answer to where the inspiration came from. And so who who really is is this right for? I mean, what can people who join the the Astro Travel Club, what can they expect? And yeah, I, I want to hear like who is the ideal person for this club? Okay, well, first of all, I'm just going to read one little paragraph that kind of gets you into the mindset of it. It's on all of our promotional stuff. But we say here, the Astro Travel Club is a club designed to bring together lovers of affordable luxury solo travel. What we mean by this is the kind of travel that places an emphasis on luxury, comfort, and style, yet doesn't break the bank. Our main goal is to foster connections amongst like-minded travelers. Mm. Through this club, we will be able to meet, learn from, and even travel with other people who share common interests and who like to travel solo. Now, you asked me what kind of person, and I'll talk about that, and then I'll go into the benefits of the club, because basically, you'll begin to see what this thing is all about. But first of all, who's it right for? It's right for, number one, solo travelers who don't want to go or travel totally alone. And there are many people like that. You know, they're not maybe want to travel with their friends because their friends don't like the same thing. Or, you know, they have a particular interest in, say, one of the trips that I'm creating does that interest. Well, 
if they would want to do it on their own, it would be a whole lot more difficult. But if they do it within this club or within these small groups of travelers, that, you know, they're not going to have to do it totally alone. So these are, number one, people who like to travel and, and are solo travelers, but they want to be in some group, whether they're single or they're married and their husbands don't want to travel or they don't want to travel with their husbands. Now, our club will strictly offer tours for small groups. The groups will not be bigger than eight people. You know, if we have 20 people signed up, we're going to have probably three groups. But six to eight people, because I have found in all my travels, and this is one of the reasons why I'm doing it, I do not like these tours, yeah. even though some of them are a pretty high quality that have 15 or more members. And usually they they have that much, that many. And so you're in a bus and you got all these people and, you know, somebody wants to do go to the bathroom 10 times. And, you know, then there's always a person who's late and then they got some people who are too loud and other people and you can't sit in the front of the bus. I mean, it's just all this kind of stuff. And by the fourth day, people are like, Poof. but if the groups are small, you have the time and the dynamics of the whole thing. It's It's not likely to be as trying or as stressful and you you begin to bond. You have yeah. enough. You have the dynamics to bond. Okay. So, as far as demographics of our our potential or people who would join the club, they'd be young professional women looking for, say, stimulating getaways, divorcees, widowers who like to travel in style but don't want it to be ridiculously expensive, uh, married women with non-traveling husbands, and typically these are the retired baby baby boomers who now have bucket lists <laughs> and that they haven't been able to do, and they have the, the, the financial wherewithal and the time to do it, and they're just they want to. They want to go to every continent, and they want to see the pyramids, and they want to do this, that, and the other. So those are people. Uh, those are you know people who uh, will find interesting things about our travel club. Then also the last category I would say is really married uh, professional women who need me time. Mm. Uh, who need to get away, detach from the stress of their responsibilities so they can recharge their batteries. And, and uh, you know, they might not want to be totally by themselves, but they just want to be away from everybody they know, their familiar environment, and say, you know, they love the theater. And I have a five-day trip to London that uh, focuses on the theater. We do all kinds of, uh, we go to a performance every day or night, and we do some, you know, other things that are are intellectually stimulating, dealing with appreciating theater or understanding theater more, et cetera. And then we sprinkle it with some shopping and, you know, going to some different types of restaurants and and that kind of thing. So for a, a woman that uh, has a lot of responsibility, married, kids, everything, sometimes she just wants to jump off the ship for just a little while. I mean, she's not going anywhere, but she needs me time. So this is also a good way that things can be taken care of. It'll give her a good vehicle mm. to explore and, and not to create any more stress. And also, really, uh, my trips, and I'm going to talk about uh, this a little bit more, but my trips or the Astrid Travel Club trips will usually be theme-based or they will be focused on one kind of special interest. So say you're interested in gardens or, like I said, theater, and we have a trip, say, theater, you know, London theater trip that, that focuses on that. This gives you an opportunity, just like that classical dance trip to St. Petersburg. We did a lot of different things that are culturally noteworthy in St. Petersburg, but the focus was on classical dance and the fact that we were able to do some really 
very high-minded things was extra special. And I can tell you, the trip that I created, if some other company would have done it, it would have been three and a half times the cost. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to get the level of, of uh, input from the experts we did. But I I was fortunate because I had met a few very interesting people on my trips to Russia, and they they were marvelous. They yeah. put it together great. Two trips that we have that I really have, as you say, baking in the oven, or things that I'm thinking about, two specialty trips. And this kind of gives you a little bit more understanding of my mindset, is uh, one, I'd like to go to Paris. Everybody loves Paris, and Paris has had a lot of issues the last year and a half, and you know, the whole world is kind of on edge and rattling to a certain extent. But you still need to to uh, take it a day at a time and carry on, as they say in England. And I love France so much, especially Paris. It must have been two and a half years now. I took two women to Paris, and we stayed there a week. And what we wanted to do, our original... The original inspiration was for the trip was the Dior exhibit that was at the Louvre. And I had read about it in several magazines, and it kept itching me in the back of my mind, like, God, that is just spectacular what they've done. And especially if you like clothes or fashion or whatever, and I do. And I, I kept thinking that would be so cool to go to to see that. Well, I mentioned it to one of my friends that's on a board that I'm on. I said, guy, I just, and I said, I really would like to go that. And she she looked at me straight on. She said, Astrid, I'd love to go there. And I said, okay, Sharon, let me think about it. If I can put it together for us, like, you know, around $3,650 for a good premium economy ticket or maybe a business class in a five-star hotel, that wasn't, you know, like tip top, but it was very nice for this price. Would you be interested? She said, yeah, do, let's see if we can do it. So I got on there and magic, it came up. We figured it out. Well, this trip turned out to be so great. We did not only go to the Dior exhibit. We, I scheduled a meeting or a, an appointment with a Parisian stylist because we all decided, well, we're older and we need a updo or a revision of our look and let's see if we can get get some good advice in Paris. Woo <laughs> so I love the internet and I research and whoa, all this. So I drilled it down to three stylists and I ended up zeroing in on one one younger woman. And so what I did was is I made appointments or uh, or reservations with her for for me and the two other ladies that went with me on the trip. Oh, it was fantastic. She made us do all kinds of different things before we left with taking photographs of what we wear to this, that, and the other in our closet, answering questions. I mean, she did a complete psychological <laughs> breakdown, or I think, on both of us. But when we got to Paris, we had, uh, I think it, she spent about, four or five hours with each one of us. She made a complete booklet. We went through all kinds of different things. She also arranged for us, and this really wasn't even part of the trip, but she said there were two things she did that was fabulous. She said, she asked her, she said, would you like to uh, go to a private boutique that sells very beautiful undergarments? And all I could think of is my daughter always says, Mommy, you have such nice clothes, but your wear is terrible. <laughs> so, so she offered this to us to go to this mm-hmm. boutique. Oh, my God. That was so, I mean, you know, the, the French are famous for beautiful underwear. I mean, that's part of their Ten Commandments. You know, you can't have a beautiful, you know, uh, Chanel bag and have bags. <laughs> undergarments, you know, and red lipstick and, you know, good perfume and a few other things that they, like the blue blazer. I mean, the undergarments are very important. So when that was offered to me, 
Uh, and one lady didn't want to do it, but Sharon did. So we went, oh, that was so interesting. It, we had two and a half, three hours. We had tea first. We talked. And then had we did all the measurements. And then she came out with all this gorgeous stuff. And it was very affordably priced. It was much more affordable than what you would get at some of the really high-end undergarments. So that was a really cool experience on top of all of the style tips that she had given us and do's and don'ts. Plus, another thing is she got us into this vintage showing of all of the top brands like Hermes, Chanel, Valentino. They had this showing of these vintage goods at the uh, hotel, I think it was the Bristol, but it was a beautiful affair. I mean, the people there, there weren't that many people there. It was, you know, by invitation only and tickets were sold. But the people there, I thought, oh, my God, these people are so beautiful. I mean, I really was taken aback. I thought, boy, this is what you see in these magazines. (laughs) And I bought a beautiful antique Hermes scarf for like, I I think it was $380, something that, I mean, I would have thought it was going to cost $1,500. But the lady who was selling them, she had written the three anthologies on every scarf that was made in a certain period, the title of it, how it was inspired. I mean, this, this was unbelievable. So that was part of this Paris trip. Then we made our own perfume. And of course, we went shopping on Avenue Montaigne and Rue Saint Honore, uh, Faubourg Saint Honore. I always mess up the name of that street, but I can fly there like a honing pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> so we did really girly things. And that was so much fun focusing on that because usually. When you go, you know, you'll do some food and you'll shop some and go to the Louvre or do some. But you don't focus on the things that you used to when you were young. So we did all these kinds of things. We had such a great trip. I mean, those two ladies always say, oh, God, that Paris trip. So what I want to do for next year is to create a trip to Paris that focuses on fashion and food and have a little bit of some of the things that we did when we went with the ladies, but also with the food. Because one of the things that I did, well, they also did it with me, is we went on a Michelin food tour. Mm. Now, I love food tours, but I thought in Paris, maybe there's a food tour that takes you only to Michelin restaurants. Yes, there was one. Mm. Oh, God. And then the cafes, of course, and the bistros and the steak tatar, and then, you know, the the fabulous other restaurants. I mean, my daughter and I ate in two restaurants that, well, actually four. One was at the Bacharach Museum, and they have a, a restaurant there, oh, and they have a shop there. Oh, it's in the 16th arrondissement. It was so, so, that's all I can say. It was just. Oh, my God. (laughs) I love it when you get this bliss look on your face. (laughs) It was bliss. But what I'm saying is I want to create a Mm. trip with this kind of ethos. And the main thing is I want to try to get, because this is one thing I've always wanted to do, is to go to a runway show at Paris Fashion Week. I want to do it during that period. That's one inspiration for a trip that I have for next year. And this is just to show you that my trips are going to have some kind of specialty or theme focused. It might not be, you know, your cup of tea. And that might not be the way you want to experience Paris. But to me, if you do just too much of sightseeing or too much of just kind of like what everybody else does, it's still a good trip. Yeah. But it doesn't have that special kind of dimension to it that makes it a great trip and that's a that's the kind of thing I like also I have in the in my idea of doing a gardens of London tour which goes during the Chelsea flower show now I have been to the Chelsea flower show oh and that is fabulous for people who like horticulture and gardens and everything oh 
this is to die for event because mm. they have like black tie, the whole thing. You know, you've got fabulous new uh, plants being shown and flowers and accessories and gardens are created and judged and it's just everything you can think of. But combining that in visiting other manors and uh, mansions and palaces with gardens and learning about, you know, the different types of English gardens and why the English love uh, their gardens so much. And it going out to the Cotswolds for a day trip as well as I have never been to the, I think it's called the Shropshire or the, the castle where Downton Abbey is. Mm. But they have so many cool things now that they've developed in terms of when you go visit this particular uh, castle. So I want to make that come alive. I want for myself. And then Blenheim Castle, which I have not been to either. I've been to a lot of them. But this was where Churchill, Mm. this was his family. And this is where he was in many of his trying times and famous times was in this particular castle when he painted and, you know, his ups and downs. So I'm just sharing this right now because this is what I have in the makes and what I'm thinking about in 2020. But I already have, we already have two trips planned now, and I will be getting to those later on the, in the show. But the benefits of belonging to this club, like I said, we're going to be small groups, six to eight people. And if we have more than that, then I'll probably arrange for we have three groups and we do things at different times. So, you know, it, it stays small, it stays intimate, and you have the ability to bond, et cetera. The trips will be to one city. And they'll be to interesting cities all over the world. It's no packing, unpacking. It'll be one city. It will be anywhere from four days to maybe nine or ten days, just depending on what the focus is and obviously all the different things to do in the city. Like in Paris, you could stay there for (laughs) for the rest of your life (laughs) and not explore everything. So be one city no packing, unpacking, etc. The trips will be luxury, but definitely affordably priced. One of the biggest draws is it will not have the single supplement. And that is one of the things that really caused me to start traveling solo by myself and not even considering any of the tours or whatever, because you were always penalized and you were forced to pay fare and a half, say if a trip cost $1,000 for two people or a, a couple, a uh, 1000 a piece, for you, they would put a 50% upcharge because you were a single or solo traveler, and you would have to pay $1,500. Well, that irked me so much. That just totally irked me. So I, I started really, that was one of the things I started, well, I'm just going to figure out how to do this myself. I mean, I went around the world by myself because I started looking at those luxury tours and they were astronomically priced for 26 days uh, for a solo traveler. I went, oh, no, there's no way I could invest that in something good. You know what I'm (laughs) saying? I did it on my own and I did it for less than half the price, stayed in all five star hotels, Flew business class, except in the United States, and I was gone twice the length. I was Mm. gone, I think it was 50 days, and most of the -the round-the-world trips with the luxury tour companies are around 26 days, because that's really what most people, they don't like to be away from home any longer than that. And my trips, like I said, will be anywhere from 9 to 10 days. That's typically when people start hitting the brick wall, the first brick wall of his like uh I've, I, you know i've had enough of this i want to go home but no single supplement mm-hmm. so there'll be one price for everybody and you'll have your own room you don't have to share it to get a discount or anything like that we'll be staying in five-star hotels or really nice upscale boutique hotels 
you'll always have a great variety of food experiences because I have found in my travels, and especially now, that there is a big focus on foodies and celebrity chefs and cuisine fusion and all of that. I mean, food is really an exciting thing to experience. So you'll have a lot of food experiences from street food to ethnic food to the best restaurants uh, available or whatever. I mean, I'm going to, I'll sprinkle it with, you know, the trip will have some of that to where you get the feel. You've been there, done that. And expert guides. Well, that's one of the things that I've learned in my travel. If you can get guides that are really, really good, and there's ways to get them. And I have some very good contacts in order to to run down those rabbit traps (laughs) to, to find them. So you will get really good guides on my trips because I'm really discerning with that. I just, that is so important, you know, rather than somebody says, okay, we're going to go here in five minutes. This is it. Flags up. You know what I'm saying? No. I mean, there has to be a dialogue between you and the guide, and everybody has to feel comfortable enough to either ask questions or or listen properly. And, and the presentation has to be, something that uh, really you can absorb. It can't just be kind of this, that, and the other. Yeah, Yeah. and and you don't piece it together. You can't connect the dots. Then also, uh, now, this is something that I don't quite have the feel for, like my ultra-cool Madeline, my partner, but she's younger, and she said one of the things that she thought would be great to do was create an online forum called the Astrid Travel Club Forum. And this would take the place of, say, club meetings. Or this would also have discussion pages on it. This would be a platform where people could come, similar to TripAdvisor, to ask questions from people and people could share their answers. Or uh, we could propose questions like, where do you want to go for a food experience? Or... Just anything. We we could pose questions from the Astro Travel Club and get uh, uh, feedback. This is also a place where other people could share their past experiences mm. and uh, help other people in terms of don't do this. I know Madeline, <laughs> she posted uh, one of my blogs that I wrote uh, when I went to Athens about the unforgettable taxi ride. This taxi ride that I had, it was something else. Well, it's posted on the forum, first and foremost, to to share the tips of what you have to do in order to never put yourself vulnerable when you're going from point A to point B, really, whether you use a taxi or not. But many times the taxi is the alternative, okay? And I'm very good at always doing the things that I say. But this one time, (laughs) (laughs) I let things slide. And boy, that was an unforgettable taxi ride. But so she put this up there to show some different things and, and to get comments and to also to share our tips, et cetera. So you have this forum that we're going to develop, and this club is open to international people. Mm-hmm. You know, my website is international. And what happens is, or what I envision, is we will have groups of people, like, say, maybe a a, a, a doctor from Brazil and a, a lawyer from Australia, a small business owner maybe from China, or, you know, and then bring these these unique people together. And our trips will either be women only, you know, mixed uh, men and, and uh, women or men only if that's requested. But bringing together people who, say, are interested in gardens from all over the world and staying and being together for six to nine days getting to know each other, eating with each other, and learning about each other and their cultures. I mean, this is the way, in my opinion, uh, we keep the world together. 
and peaceful is to get to know each other first because then we won't have all these irrational fears or, you know, hang-ups. So I feel like this in my own way is a great forum for, for people to get to know other people from all over the world. So that's another benefit. Now, the other thing that we're offering is when you join... And we haven't totally settled on this. So we've opened, we got one set uh, and we didn't like them, but we are offering a really nice travel journal. And in this journal, it's different than just receiving a travel journal with blank pages. We have put together what we consider are 15 questions Mm. that help you start thinking about how you want to experience the upcoming trip. It gives you, it sensitizes your mindset to experience where you're going to the fullest. So there are lots of questions. Some of them are common sense questions that you'd probably think about, but maybe you wouldn't think about thinking about them or answering unless somebody tickled you to do it. You, You see what I'm saying? And then we have some other questions that you might not think about. And so we're putting our questions in. The The book is going to be, I'm pretty sure, leather. It'll definitely have interior pockets, and, you know, we'll put the questions in there, and we might put one other little thing. We haven't totally decided, but we're going to, that will be decided by Monday, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but you'll get this, and this will help you keep those memories alive and keep the things that you really experience that you want to do differently when you come home. And if you write in your journal, I've found every day, just recapping your day, let your thoughts flow. You're not writing for your English teacher. It doesn't make any difference. You can write whatever you want, good, bad, or ugly, okay? But when you go back and you read it, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started blogging, because I started writing in travel journals about 25 years ago, and I would read these journals later on when I thought, God, that was, you know, really good. <laughs> and, and I forgot that. And, you know, I mean, it's part of, well, it's part of recording, to tell you the truth, your life and mm-hmm. how your life, uh, how you develop as a person, because travel is one of the greatest teachers in anything that you can do for yourself. Well, and I know you've brought that to us throughout the time we've done solo travel talk is the, your experience journaling. And I love how you always say it's like it fixes things in your mind and it allows you to explore. It's kind of like a way to process and to really absorb. And so I love this. And also listeners, I got the privy of looking at some of the questions. I love it. I think it's going to be at the very least the prompting to do it. It gives you a little context. So if you if you kind of get lost in your own journaling, it'll get you started. It's I, I like it a lot. Yeah. Even though I was part of it and created it, <laughs> I, I mean, put that aside, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I really it's do. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but it comes from a lot of my experience. Right. And also Madeline. Madeline, even though she's young, she's traveled quite a bit. She's very intelligent. She writes beautifully, and uh, she's she gets it. She gets travel, and she gets people's psyches and the benefits, and we've done a good job with yeah. this. We just have to get the, the physical journal like we like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to clarify, the forum is for members only. Yes, yes, yes. These are benefits to belong to the club, okay? Then you get first dibs to go on the trips. Now, you don't have to be- belong to the club to go on the trips, but if you join the club, which is $50 a year, you get a $100 discount on one Astrid Travel Club trip a year. So basically, you get your, <laughs> your money back, your plus, dues yeah. back, or your fee back, and then a discount. And we really, we're charging the the fee, to tell you the truth, because... Well, we want to cover the expense for the little journal, but that's not quite as as important to me. I want people who are committed to the club, to the concept of what we're doing. I mean, I want somebody who really buys into what we're thinking about, what we're going to offer, 
uh, the types of travel that we're going to do and the types of people that I feel like will do these these trips and, and the mindset on the forum, et cetera. And like anything, if it's a value, you're going to pay for it. So I've made the fee on something that I think is reasonable. But if you belong to the trip, you get first dibs. I mean, the club, you get first dibs on going the trip because the trips can fill up. But one of the things that we we uh, want to do is after we get about eight trips that we feel really interesting, solid trips that we have executed and we know they we know the flow is good because all my trips will have interesting activities with a focus. We'll do, you know, a splattering of sightseeing and and, you know, must do's and this kind of thing. But it'll have a rhythm and a flow to it where you're not doing too much. Uh, and then you'll have free time. And my whole pace is geared to when you come back, say, that was a lot of fun. Fun, free time. And as Catherine always says, Astrid, your itineraries have flair. <laughs> the trips will have flair. <laughs> That's really the benefits, uh, Catherine, for being in the club. That's the kind of person I uh, went into yeah. the the types of people that I think would uh, are are key me- uh, types of people who would want to be members. Now, one thing I didn't also go into: our trips are going to range from anywhere from twenty five hundred or two thousand five hundred dollars to five thousand seven hundred and fifty, and of course. The up more expensive trips will be to cities that are more expensive and if we're doing more things that require specialists. And to keep the group small, it raises the price, yeah. okay? But I always look at per day cost when I'm trying to figure out my cost and, you know, doing this, that, and the other. But there'll be anywhere from 500 to to $1,000 a day. Now, some people go $1,000 a day, but this covers everything. Yeah. This covers, now my trips won't cover the airfare, gratuities, and, you know, your shopping and that kind of thing. But when I budget out my trips, I put everything in there. And I try to get it to be between $500 to $1,000 a day. The sweet spot usually for me is about $650, $650 a day, which means that includes room, it includes food, it includes logistics, includes my shopping, which is always a problem. <laughs> uh, it includes everything. And, and I always fly business class when I go over the pond. So, you know, if I can keep it in that range, that's pretty good. And if you price out any of the tours, they're more than that. Yeah. They're, some of them are a lot more than that. So it's luxury in nature, but the price is still what I consider very affordable and definitely for the, uh, um, you know, the quality. So, you know, solo travelers or, or, or uh, potential people who want to join the club, you're going to get ideas. Yeah. You're going to get inspiration. The forum will allow you to ask questions. You know, then, of course, you can share your uh, your past things that have happened to you, good, bad, and ugly, unforgettable restaurants, you know, hotels. So there's a lot of things that we put down in our benefits now that I think really are uh I think are great. Yeah. I think they're very exciting. And we're going to have more. This is just, you know, we just birthed this yeah, baby. Yeah, we're launching it, yeah. <laughs> she would say. <laughs> or this balloon. You should see our cute I logo. I love it. Oh, I have this hot air balloon that, uh, well, uh, Astrid Solo Travel Advisor, our colors are gold, white, and black. And we have this kind of oh, yin-yang or half yin-yang symbol with a star. Because my name means star. Well, I have created this uh, hot air balloon that's gold and white. You know, the balloon part and the bucket with the... Oh, it's just so cute. All I, When I see I it, know. I go, 
up, up, and away. Let's go where we want to go now, gang. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So that's a long answer to your question that's on, okay. you know, what's it all about? Who's it for? And the uh, benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know you, you mentioned some, you've been dreaming of some of the additional trips, but you actually have some things that are on the calendar. So tell us about those. Okay. Now these are real time sensitive. And any yeah. of my listeners that are listening to this, if you are interested in these trips, we're getting close to deadlines, et cetera. And I hate this, but it took us a little bit longer to launch, but we, like we, does, yeah, yeah, it does. It, it really mm-hmm. does. But I have two trips. Number one, I have a trip, a six-day trip to Cartagena, Colombia, which we're billing it, experience the colorful culture of Cartagena. It will be from October the 3rd to October the 8th. 2019, we should say. Yeah, this year. And then the second trip is Magical Marrakesh, experience the exotic culture of the Pink City. And that will be a nine-day trip, and it'll start or uh, it'll be from November the 30th through the 8th of December. Now, here are the details of both the trips, and I love both of these places so much. I mean, Cartagena last year when I went there just blew me away. I thought, my gosh, this is Cuba, and I've always wanted to go to Cuba And then it opened up, and now it's closed back again. But Cuba hasn't really been opened enough up to to really do a lot of refurbishing of a lot of the things. They've started, but Cartagena has got a lot of things that have been redone, et cetera. And it's all that same colonial Spanish feel, Portuguese, and everything. Caribbean. Oh, Oh, it's fabulous. It is considered the crown jewel of Colombian tourism. And I know a lot of people have a bad uh, idea of Colombia that it's scary to go to. It's a drug, you know, it's terrible there and all that. Well, it's changed. It's changed. Now, you know, there are drugs everywhere. But for about the last, I'd say, five to eight years, they have really focused on Colombia being oriented into the real world and not just mandated and controlled from behind the scenes. So it's really opened up and lots of great things are going on there. I ended up deciding I was going to go there. And I can tell you, well, first of all, this and as much as I know, I couldn't believe this. I didn't realize that Cartagena was in South America. I knew it was in the Caribbean. But I thought it was on the, you know, in Central America. I didn't think it was, uh, I thought that Columbia was kind of, I, I guess I didn't pay quite enough attention in geography, but I love geography. It's the northernmost port, really, in the Caribbean Sea in South America. This is a place where tropical breezes are always blowing. And the first thing when you get off of the airplane And you get there and you just realize, oh, my God, this is like you can just feel the 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 stress leave you with those breezes and every it's just the perfect setting. If you want to go for a getaway that has a rich culture that is upscale, but that's also very relaxed. Mm. It's just not all touristy. Mm. I mean, it's just, it's got, it's got a real, it's kind of reminds me of New Orleans. New Orleans just still has such a culture. And that's what gets people loving New Orleans so much, besides the, some of the architecture and the food, et cetera. But that all flows into it. But the old town of Cartagena is just absolutely gorgeous with all of those renovated Spanish colonial buildings. They have all these bougainvilleas and and Mm. hibiscus and all these tropical flowers flowing off the balconies and from building to building. And and it's beautiful in the in the daytime, but it is even more beautiful at night the way they have it lit up and then you had the carriages clop 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 all through the old town and then 
You hear all this Caribbean music coming from this square and three streets over. There's another square and they're playing and everybody is just happy. This place is nothing but happy. And the people are so happy to have other people coming to visit them. They don't know a lot of English yet. and But the first question you'll get is, are you having a good time? Do you like Cartagena? Mm. <laughs> when you first get there, you start getting happy and with this wonderful breezes and everything. And then I was so fortunate with the hotel I chose. I chose this hotel, the uh, Charleston Hotel Charleston Santa Teresa. It was formerly, you know, some of the building itself, not the rooms or anything, but an old Spanish convent. And it is just the architecture there is exquisite. So you, you enter into this wrought iron kind of gate like uh, foyer, and then you go in and you've got this open colon. Well, it's not totally the colonnade around it is not open, but it's arched and everything. And when you check in, you don't check in at the front desk. They sit you down at a at a, a, a private desk and they offer you a coconut lemonade with or without alcohol. And they sit there and they go through all the amenities of the hotel and get you in. It's just class, class, class. But it's a very relaxed class. And then also in this downstairs, they have this wonderful open air atrium where they do have a roof they can put over if it rains, but that's where you take your breakfast every day. And it's a beautiful buffet. I usually allow myself 45 minutes for breakfast, sometimes an hour. I would linger there almost two hours. I just loved it. And I took a, I, somebody took a photograph of me eating in that restaurant. That's one of the best photographs that's ever been taken of me in my entire life. And I think it is because of just the vibe there. It's just absolutely just fabulous. Just being at this hotel, the rooms are really nice. The beds are great. Pillows are great. Bathrooms are great. You get like a, uh, you know, fruit basket that I ate all the way. And you have like these balconies, or if you don't have a balcony, in this atrium, they have a balcony that goes all the way around. And right by my room, I kind of had a private area where I could uh, lie on these uh, chaise lounges. And I found myself sometimes at 830 at night, I would go out there and the breezes were blowing. I could see the beautiful steeple of the cathedral all lit up from this balcony. And I'd sit out there on the chaise lounge at, at 9.30, I'd find myself waking up like I had fallen asleep, like I was like <laughs> paradise lost or something. And then the spa is wonderful there. It's all brand new, high tech, really great. We got a rooftop pool that gives you a, you know, a view of the Caribbean Sea and Boca Grande, which is kind of like the Miami Beach section of Cartagena. Cartagena has an old town and then Boca Grande and a couple of other areas. But my tour or the tour for the Astra Travel Club will focus only in the old town because that's where the real culture is mm. per se. And uh, so the hotel itself is like, let me tell you, you don't even have to go and do anything else too much in Cartagena. <laughs> you could just stay at this hotel. And one of the absolute favorite things that I did is at nighttime, they do in front of the hotel in the square, they they have like an open air restaurant and bar where they have a salsa band that plays until midnight and they have this beautiful kind of contemporary fountain that goes through it and they have these different tables and seating areas and couches and everything that's outside and you hear the clopping from the carriages and the salsa music and the breeze coming off and the coconut limeades I mean, the the servers are so well trained. After like the second night, they know what you like, and when they seat you, and they're all like all dressed in white, they seat you, and they say, "Well, would you like, uh, you know, a glass of Chardonnay or you know, whatever?" I can't remember 
what I was it would drink. But I, every night I would sit out there and I would write in my journal. It was like heaven. It really was just sitting in that hotel at night. I mean, that's when you know you're at the right place, mm. and you just you just are so thankful that you have this experience. So. That's the hotel we're going to stay in. By the way, I, I, mean, I have I've many times said that your secret superpower is finding hotels. So this is not a surprise to me at all that you found this place. Oh, no. I mean, I'm not bragging, but I must say I do have some kind of radar. Yeah. When you, it, it's your superpower. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The hotel is great. Now, most people who will be traveling into Cartagena will get there around, you know, two o'clock ish in the afternoon. That's when a lot of the flights get into Cartagena. So you'll probably check in at around three. Well we'll have an evening tour of the old city. And when I tell you Cartagena is more beautiful in the evening than it is in the day, and it is gorgeous in the day. I mean, you can go on on the uh, web and look at photographs of Cartagena, you're going to see some of the most beautiful photographs of architecture and tropical plants and flowers and everything. I mean, it when I call it colorful Cartagena, it is very colorful. Well, we're going to take this tour at night and get, you know, get a feel for the old town because you will, in your free time, be walking in Old Town. And and our hotel is so well located. I mean, it's right on one of the main, because it's Cartagena is just, you know, north, south, east, west streets. There's not too much curving and that kind of thing. It does have some around the wall, right. per se, but it's, you can't get lost. All roads lead to, to the to the Caribbean Sea, really. It's either this way or that way. And, you know, you, you, and if you get lost, turn right. If you don't find it, go the other way. You'll run into where you want to go. But we'll start with the evening tour of Old Town. And the next day, we won't wake up bright and early because that's the one thing I like is the first night, get a good night's sleep. So, at a, you know, we'll eat and then around 1030, we're going to go to, and it'll be like a small specialty tour, a food tour. We're going to go to a Colombian coffee tasting and chocolate tasting. Because, you know, Colombia is known for their coffee. Well, I didn't realize they also are known for their, well, the cocoa bean, the chocolate. So they have absolutely to die for chocolate. So that'll be <laughs> the first part of, of uh, the second day. Then you'll be free to eat whatever kind of lunch you want to. Because you'll have a, enough of a feel. You're not going to get lost to find somewhere to eat. And we're going to have a list of places and we'll mm. have a map uh, where you can eat. But, you know, you're going to probably want some kind of local ethnic thing to eat. Might not be that hungry after the chocolate <laughs> yeah, and the coffee. But still, you know, we'll give you time to kind of detach. And then we are going to do, and I don't know, some people might not like this, but Columbia had a Nobel prize-winning writer, author, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Marquez. And he absolutely thought Cartagena was magical. He loved Cartagena. It was a setting for a lot of uh, what he wrote about in his books. He, he loved being there. So this tour will enlighten you all about his life, his literature, some of the, you know, the places that he hung out, what it meant to him, how it stimulated his creativity. I mean, I think this is going to give a wonderful, extra, extraordinary viewpoint of Cartagena and Colombia. And what makes Colombia so classy and special? Because before I went there, I didn't even really pay attention to it because all I thought it was about Pablo Escobar. <laughs> Even though he's kind of an interesting guy, he's not on the right side of the law. But, I mean, he he was something else. <laughs> so, and all of those cronies that went along with it. But the bottom line is, is Cartagena, there, there, there's a lot of really special 
ethos there. So this will get get you into some of of uh, that kind of understanding that you couldn't get without it. So I'm very excited about that. Then in the end of the day, you're going to be up on top of the wall because there's a wall that goes all the way around Old Town Cartagena at Cafe Del Mar. Now, this is a touristy place, but everybody has to go there. I mean, it's like when you go to Paris, you got to go, you know, one time to the Louvre, or you've got to walk down the Champs Elysees. Well, if you go to Cartagena, you have to have one drink at the Cafe Del Mar because the sunsets, the go that you watch from that point on the Caribbean are like one of a kind. So we're going to have a evening drink and watch mm. the sunset go down from there. And then after that, we'll walk down the street and go to La Vitrola, which is a fabulous Italian restaurant that's one of the best restaurants in the city. So we'll just linger there and eat, and then we'll walk to the hotel because it's like two blocks away. That's day two. Then day three, it, it will start with, uh, a shopping tour. And that won't start bright and early at nine because they don't wake up early in Cartagena. So that's one good thing. You can stay up late and wake up late, but it'll start around 10 30 or whatever. And we will have a shopping tour. And when I tell you shopping in Cartagena is fun, it is fun, fun, fun because it's a unique blend of ethnic things that can be pricey or it can be super affordable because they have all these markets and they have all these street sellers. And a lot of the street sellers really are selling knockoffs. So the shopping tour will give you uh, the background to know what the knockoffs are and what mm. the real stuff are and where you go to get the real stuff. Or if you want the knockoffs or whatever, that's your own deal. They're going to show you where the markets are, et cetera. And they are these. It, it, it's all fun. And then on top of that, Colombia, and specifically in Cartagena, they have some internationally famous uh, fashion designers. Because Cartagena, I mean, when they go out to eat at night at some of the really nice places or their cultural events, they are dressed. And I mean, when I tell you they are dressed like Latin American upper crust wealthy people, they really still dress. It's no, like, casual, <laughs> dressy casual. It might be dressy casual, but it has a lot of real fashion mm -hmm. or real style. When I saw it, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is like Italy or, or France or even Spanish. I mean, their clothes are very well made and very well designed. That's the word I was thinking, designed. So we're going to go on a, a shopping tour, and we're going to learn about the markets, the boutiques, how to buy, what's good, what's not good, what's unique, etc. Then in the afternoon, we're going to have and come. I'm going to tell everybody, <laughs> do not eat very much for breakfast because this food tour is going to be a food and a culture tour. It's going to take you in another area of Cartagena where really more of the locals live, mm. and you're going to get a real flavor for all the different flavors of uh, food in Cartagena, which, I mean, Arthur Anthony Bourdain loved Cartagena because it had such a fabulous food scene. And the people are so interesting with the, with the different types of of ethnic groups that make up this um, this culture there. So we'll have a good food tour. Then after that, we will go take salsa lessons to wear it off. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you want to stay after the salsa lessons, you can dance. You know, you can just, you know, go ahead and dance it all off you yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Then the next day, we're going to leave Cartagena and go to a village uh, or a small town called uh, Palenque, Palenque. And this is, well, it's actually in the foothills of the mountains. And it's going to, it was the first free town in the Americas, which was founded in the early 1600s by uh, escaped slaves. So it really 
will give you great insight into the Afro-Colombian culture. And, you know, you'll, we'll eat some things there. There will be, you'll just see a lot of their, uh, their dance culture, their music. There'll be some arts and crafts. If you've ever seen pictures of Cartagena and you see the ladies who have the fruits, fruit baskets on the top of their head, they're uh, palenqueros or whatever. They're from palenque. And they come actually every day with all the fruit that's grown in that area. And they're all colorfully dressed. And they, they're part of what uh, makes Cartagena, gives it that real soul. So we're going to go to where a lot of uh, um, the African-Caribbean people of this area, where they started and where still a lot of them live. And, and they love their culture. And I think they even have their own kind of dialect and everything. Mm -hmm. So you'll get, you'll get a, a smorgasbord of that. And you'll get kind of close to the mountains and out of Cartagena. So I think it'll be very interesting. In all our trips, if you don't want to go to something, don't go. Just stay and do your own thing. If it's not, if that's not what you want to do, because the trips aren't going to be super expensive. So you feel like, oh my God, if I don't do this, I've just blown all this money. Nah, you know, if you don't want to like to do that, you don't have to do it. Okay. Then day five, there's going to be a lot of free time, especially I, I think I did it all morning till the, the later afternoon. Like I think it's about two 30. Then we're going to take an emerald tour. And we're going to learn all about emeralds because Colombia, part of its uh, economy, really for a long time was funded by the the emerald trade coming out of Colombia. And when I went, I bought a beautiful emerald and uh, I met a very wonderful, uh, interesting woman who owned a uh, store specializing in emeralds. But they'll, you'll have an emerald tour. You'll go to the little museum You'll learn about emeralds, and, you know, you'll have an opportunity. You might want to buy something. But uh, I almost didn't put that in the in the tour, but I thought, it's too Colombian. You have to do that. So if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. You can go do something else. And then it, our farewell dinner will be a Colombian cooking class where we'll oh. take a cooking class, and then we'll eat what we <laughs> we cooked, and we'll drink and then we'll go back to the hotel and I'll be back. Well, I'm not going to go on this trip, but I bet you y'all will be in front of that hotel <laughs> listening to that salsa band. <laughs> the price of the trip is $2,950. And the way we do all of our trips is that you have to pay in three installments. So it'll be a $500 deposit, a $1,500 uh, second installment, and then $950. I think it's in, I can't remember what date now that we put it. But for all of that, you can read all about this in the website because it's all there now. But you get five nights at this fabulous hotel, all those tours, English-speaking private guide, of course, five breakfasts, one lunch, uh, four dinners, the cooking class, the salsa class, <laughs> private uh, transportation to and from the airport. So really everything is taken care of. Mm. The only thing that is not included and never included in any of our trips is going to be the airfare because the airfare is so hard to price and there'll be people coming from different, you know, areas of the world and they have different schedules, blah, blah, blah. So airfare is not included. A couple of meals are not included because we wanted to give you the option to eat Freedom. wherever yeah. you want to eat. Of course, gratuities, and then travel insurance, which we always, I mean, when I tell you, I highly recommend it. I highly, 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 <laughs> highly recommend it. Because anything can happen when you're traveling now. I mean, from the weather delays to, you know, you twisting your ankle or you losing your luggage or anything can happen. And one thing can make everything go downhill. Okay, I know I'm getting a little long-winded, Catherine, but I can't help it because I get so excited about you know, all these things because I've been there, I've done all these things, and I just, I know how quality-oriented uh, what we're offering yeah. is because I've been on the others. And then there's nothing wrong with them, but they don't have a lot of what the spirit in the deeper dive into to my itineraries. 
And and that is another reason why I only want to go to one place because it gives you the opportunity to really absorb something on a deeper level. And when you do that, it's much more meaningful. Well, and I think people are getting that the mindset is like the starting point for the club and for these trips. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not just going to go. Doing it. It's, yeah. 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 There's yeah. a mindset to it. Absolutely. Okay. Marrakesh. And Marrakesh is like no other city in the world. I mean, take yourself from the Caribbean and the breezes and the coconut limeade and, the, you know, and, 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 and I had one lady say, told me, she said, well, last time, I don't know if I want to go to Cartagena because I've been to Antigua, I've been to Jamaica, I've been, but, and I told her, I said, let me tell you something. It is not like all these others. It is really has a whole different vibe, even though, you know, it is on the Caribbean and there's some similarities, but there's a lot of difference there. But Marrakesh, totally different. Exotic sights, sounds, smells. I mean, when you get there, you're just like, it's completely different. <laughs> you know? So I think this trip is just going to be absolutely super. Because first of all, it gives the solo traveler who wants to experience Marrakesh and feel comfortable going to a place like Marrakesh, the ability to really get into what is there to experience. Because I know there are a lot of people who they read about Marrakesh and think, oh, that is so cool. But to the uh, thought of them to go there or and to go there solo mm, yeah. would never. Now, yeah. I did, and I loved it. I never was the least bit uncomfortable. I could go there over and over again. It is so interesting Talk about fabulous food. I mean, the shopping, even though it's a little different because it, it's more ethnic, those souks and all of that stuff, I mean, really, you have got to have your head screwed on straight to be <laughs> able to cope with it. But that's part of their culture yeah. and how they make every day kind of like a, a new experience with the haggling and with putting different things together and just the whole uh, commerce of life. You know, it's it really goes through that whole psyche of yeah. Marrakesh. But we're going to be staying in the most beautiful, I mean, this place, I call it Shangri-La. It's, <laughs> a, it's a Riyadh that was a villa of one of the most wealthy prior citizens of Marrakesh and it's actually out it's not in the in the gates or you know in the old city it's outside in the Palmeri area which is this is an area it's just like a giant palm tree grove uh, and it just they have so many ultra wealthy people mm. that built these extraordinary villas well, this particular Riyadh is in there, and this gentleman who owns it now inherited it from his father. And this Riyadh is on 10 acres. It's basically a, a palm plantation. And after the first five hours, I thought, this is just Shangri-La. I'm, I'm actually in Shangri-La now. Mm. This is unbelievable. But this villa, first of all, is filled with... Moroccan antiques. It's absolutely exquisite. And the gentleman who owns it, he inherited it. And at first he wasn't going to do anything with a hotel or to have people to stay there. But he actually had gone to the hospitality school in Paris. And the way it all ended up, he decided he was going to convert it into like a Riyadh. And that he built himself another house, or there's another house kind of right on the property. But let me tell you, it is fabulous. Every room there, when you stay there, you get your own private butler. There's a beautiful swimming pool right out back that, you know, is in the this palm grove. That uh, That's where you take your breakfast every day, out by the pool. 
Uh, like at night, sometimes I would sit on one of the uh, little porches or the terraces and your butler comes up and asks you what would you like to eat or whatever and I'd tell him they bring you could sit there all night it doesn't matter also in this area is Stefan uh, the owner he loves exotic birds so he has this fabulous Avery that is there and all of these exotic birds walk around or sing in the morning and uh, every morning I would open up my French doors at about 5.30 in the morning and open them just a little, and I'd hear all those birds singing away, and I went, oh, my God, I can't believe this. This <laughs> is, like, fabulous. Then you have a huge tent, a very elegant, huge tent with two fireplaces at each end and all these oriental rugs, and it's really, like, uh, very Moroccan where you eat where you eat dinner or whatever meals you want to eat. You have to order your meals because they don't, it's not actually a restaurant, but the, this is so fabulous. I mean, I met some, some ladies from Berlin there one evening. They were traveling together on business. It, it, the, the, the fireplace going and it just, it, it, I mean, it's like what you see in the movies. And, and when I say that, it really is. This place has been in a French movie. Mm. And when I checked in, the manager, Aziz, was telling me, well, you're going to stay in the blah, blah, blah room. And I didn't know who that was. I said, well, who? What are you talking about? He said, well, this uh, at the Dor Aniwen, which is the Riyadh where we'll be staying, he said, it's a favorite place of many of the French film uh, uh, industry, they like to come here to kind of be away from everything. And we have named all the rooms after certain actors wow. or actresses that have been here and, and like this particular room. So he said, I was going to get this room. So, you know, he walked me down the hall, this huge key to open this in this gorgeous door and all this artwork and everything. And I mean, when I tell you antiques, artwork, fountains in the middle of the main area when you come in. I mean, this place is gorgeous. I go in, there's my beautiful bed, all hand carved, all those gorgeous Moroccan tiles, oriental rugs, or not oriental, but Moroccan rugs, huge bathroom, with this huge tub, I think it had some kind of shell-like figure in it that uh, I can't totally remember it now, but let me tell you, and it had all these antique French perfume bottles that I have no idea how much those things are worth, but this place was jamming. I mean, it was just unbelievable, and then they have a lot of uh, different little buildings that are, you know, e real expensive, and they have pathways, and they have a, also an outdoor bar that have those beautiful Moroccan lights. It's just exquisite. Go on the Internet and look up the Dar Aniwen, A-Y-N-I-W-E-N. It is knocked out. So that's where we're going to stay. That's it's another hotel. You mentioned about my uh, ability to pick hotels. This one was a real, I was really nervous because it was between this Riyadh and one in the Medina, in the old city. And, and most people stay there just because they want to be close to Central. the action. But this particular Riyadh, with it, you get shuttle service and it goes all day and night and up until like about, I think it's 1230 at night or something like that. And if you want it special in the middle of the night, that I mean, these are the most wonderful hosts you can ever imagine. Mm. There's no problem getting to the Medina or back or anywhere you want to go. No, no. The uh, Aziz can arrange anything, and he's just absolutely fabulous. You're going to stay at a place that you'll be happy just being there. You don't even have to <laughs> go into the Medina. <laughs> now, that says a lot because there are a lot of French people that probably come there and they do. Oh, it also has a hammam, their own hammam, where you get these fabulous scrub downs oh. and everything and massages 
and facials and oh and using the argon oil from morocco oh gosh and you have to do that and we're going to give you enough free time yeah, on my itinerary mm. this trip it, it, you're going to be able to go and have a wonderful whatever you want from the from the spa mm. and it's fantastic okay so just a little bit about the itinerary i try to pick it up a little bit and not go off because I get so excited because I just remember the <laughs> the wonderful times that I had there. But you'll take a Calaché ride, which is, this is kind of like a fancy carriage. And it'll be kind of like a tour that'll take you around the Medina and kind of give you some history and, and a little bit of a welcome thing. Because it'll be in the evening when or close to the evening because mm. we're going to take a tour of the hotel which you have to take a tour of the whole, the grounds and oh, cool. learn about the plants and the birds and all these different places where you can go and sit and read or whatever. And then after we do the Calaché ride, we're going to go to uh, Cafe Arib and have a drink and watch the sun go down because right, and that's right on the, you know, in the, it's a square. And I can't ever say the word, but it's the big square in front of the Medina uh, in in Marrakesh. But the, this uh, Cafe Arib is very famous, first of all, for the food and the atmosphere, but also for watching the sun go down. So you'll get another fabulous sunset. And you'll then you'll watch all the snake charmers <laughs> and all the dancers on, in the square. And you'll hear the call to prayer. And, and it'll go from day to dusk to night. Oh, it is just, I mean, you can just feel it. It is just, ooh. And I, I loved it. That was kind of my first day. I, I wanted to see the sunset, and I did. And I, I lingered there. And, you know, here I am, solo traveler. First full day, or maybe it was a half day, uh, I, and I got on that van. They dropped me off right there at the Medina, and I did all that. And it was about 9.30 at night, and I said, well, I, you know, I'm going to go right back where the van is, and hopefully it's everything they said is it was there right when it's supposed to be. Took me back to the, to the Riyadh. Then that night, I sat out on the porch and had a glass of wine and just looked at those stars in that clear African, northern African sky. I just, I really, I was like having (laughs) my own happening (laughs) all by myself. And what's so wonderful at this beautiful place, and you just feel totally relaxed and safe. It is fabulous. I mean, it really is. So... That's your first day. Then the second day is, you know, a real history and culture tour. And we'll take you to all the important sites and we'll really give you a background into how Marrakesh became Marrakesh, what's unique about it, and, you know, just stuff about the culture. Then in the end of the day, we're going to go to a place called Ensemble Artisanal. And it's a basically a Moroccan handicraft center, mm. and it's sponsored by the uh, Moroccan government. And what it has is all of these artists and artisans that are there working, creating all of these indigenous Moroccan crafts. And they also have stores or little shops where you can buy things. So you can watch them making the crafts. You can buy things, and all the prices there are set. There's no haggling. Oh, wow. And you can use your credit card, and there's a shipping facility right in the complex. So what I I like about this, because I spent a morning there and had lunch there, but we're going to do it in the later afternoon, is you can get an idea of really what the price is is in terms of uh, fair market value, okay? So when you go the next day to the souks and get overwhelmed with, uh, I mean, this shopping (laughs) experience, you have to be ready, kind of like battle. (laughs) I mean, you got to be ready. But there's a way to do it. There's a give and take. There's uh, a uh, a rhythm to it, maybe? Oh, yeah. First of all, you got to drink tea with them. If they don't like you, you're not getting a good deal. So you have to be in a state where 
they take to you. And it can't be anything fakey, because these people have got radar. They've seen every kind of person there ever was on life, and, you know, in life. And they they want to cut the best deal they can. So, you know, then it's, it's kind of like a the you know, a romance budding when mm. the guy really likes the mm. girl, but she's, he's <laughs> trying to really do it right. <laughs> so, so it's kind of like that. But the next day we'll go on this guided shopping tour. And that's really going to be pretty much the whole day you'll be in the souks because they've got all these different kinds of souks. I mean, they got the shoe suit, they got the, you know, the the dress suit, they got the leather goods suit, they got the lamps, they got the the stone things they make. Then you'll see the factories, and I mean, it's just this, the, and it's just a maze. It's just it's so many mazes you can't believe in. That. And then you come into that this outdoor area where there's basket making and the rugs and everything and the dyeing of the. I mean, it is in the spice market. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Well, you'll have a guided tour of it. Wow. So you'll have some sense on how to handle this, okay? And then in the evening, we'll all meet in the square, and we're going to have a fantastic food tour. That's one of the best food tours I have ever, ever. Yeah. taken was in Marrakesh. So we're going to do that food tour. I knew that was coming. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's great. <laughs> There's no this, way. It, it the, the couple that started this food tour, the lady is from uh, Morocco, and uh, her husband is American. Well, they met and married, and he ended up moving to Marrakesh. And I, I forgot what he was doing at first, but she was always into cooking and a grandmother. I, I can't remember the total story, but to make a long story short, she decided to write a cookbook. And then she wanted, she sometimes gave, gave her an idea for a food tour. And so she started this. And I mean, they're the number one food tour rated by anybody in Marrakesh. And they're cool. And they love uh, Morocco. And you learn so much about the Moroccan culture and Marrakesh and how it relates to food. I mean, this food tour is by far the best food tour I've ever taken, yeah. to include that Michelin star yeah, one no in Paris. Okay, so we'll have that at night. Then the next day, we're going to head to the mountains. We're going to head to the Atlas Mountains, which is a totally different feel from the city of Marrakesh. And you'll go to a Berber village or a couple of villages, one of which you'll probably have uh, tea with and get to see how they live. And they'll give you a little presentation. Uh, you'll also see some crafts being made in some of the villages. I know we stopped for a light lunch or coffee along this uh, st mountain stream that was very typical of what they do in this area. They they it's kind of outside, and people just sit by this stream, in in the valley. It's it's beautiful, you know. You have to kind of take off your shoes. You might get your feet wet, but it's it's cool. I went with two other doctors, a a couple, a man and a wife. Uh, they were Indian by ethnicity. And we just had the best time. The whole thing was just magical that day. We also went to an argon oil uh, factory where the ladies were singing and chanting and cracking the nuts and making the oil. And then, then we got to learn all about how it's used in different cosmetic pro uh, products, et cetera. And then, of course, you could buy some. <laughs> but the whole day was really, it was a wonderful outing because you got a real feel for the Berber culture, mm. which that is the bottom ethnic group that is is Moroccan. And it's it's very interesting. Yeah. So uh, that will be one day. And then the evening we'll close it out with a dinner featuring a belly dancer. We'll go to a really fine restaurant with the be best belly dancer and the best food in Morocco for that kind of setting. Some people don't like it, but, you know, it's all part of this culture. And she's going to be really good. Let me tell you, they're belly dancers. And then the ones that are really good, I mean, you can't believe that any <laughs> human being can do that when they're really good. Then the following day, we're going to focus on some museums. And not a lot of people, or maybe a lot of people, know that Yves Saint Laurent 
the French fashion designer loved Marrakesh. And he spent several months out of every year in Marrakesh. And he loved it so much he ended up buying a villa. And in this, uh, uh, well, it was called Jardin Majorel. And it was in uh, this garden, uh, this beautiful garden. And he ended up buying this villa and painting that electric blue or what I call Yves Saint Laurent blue and, and painting the garden some of the the plaster, the, some of the fountains and the different uh, accent pieces is blue with these plants and these bamboo trees and these palm trees. I mean, this place is another super exotic place. So it's a beautiful place to go walking through the garden and get a feel for uh, Yves Saint Laurent and why he liked it there. Then, of course, you have a wonderful gift shop where you can buy some things expensive things that uh, reek of him or some more souvenir. Then also right, you know, across the street basically is the Islamic Art Museum of Marrakesh and also the Berber Museum. So it'll give you a morning of museums and gardens. So and I think that'll be very interesting because we don't do a lot of museums on this trip, but this is kind of like focused in and you've you've already got a, a inkling of, of different things. So this will kind of tie it together, I think, going to to these places that in the morning. Then after that we will have a cooking class where we'll cook and then of course eat and then you have free time in the evening or whatever you want to do. Go back to the souks because they don't close until like they make a certain amount of money. They don't have hours. They mm. just stay open till they make a certain amount of money. <laughs> it's so funny how some of these people, their culture works, you know. Uh, I, I remember in Istanbul, I, I was out one night, and I came back, and I would always walk to my hotel in a certain way, and I'd round this curve, and they had these little shops, and it must have been like 11, 15 at night, and I was walking back, and this one shop was open, so I sauntered in there, and I started talking to the guy who was the owner, and I said, I can't believe you're still open. You know, you're a jewelry shop. You'd think you, you would have gone home by at least 9 o'clock. He said, I don't close the door till I've made what I need to make every day. Wow. <laughs> I went, whoa, no wonder you're so successful. I mean, that is what you call. It's still going, yeah, yeah. ooh. <laughs> They have a lot of different kind of beliefs in in uh, Turkey and that culture. I loved it. I really did. But back to the cooking class. Well, we'll have a cooking class. Then the last full day, uh, we will get up early. The f- only day we'll get up early. But we'll do a early sunrise hot air balloon ride over Marrakesh. And you will see the Atlas Mountains and the whole thing. Then you'll have a traditional Berber uh, uh, breakfast, which will kind of be like you'd be out in the desert. And then you'll also, if you want to, have the opportunity to ride a camel through this beautiful palm area uh, that I told you about. So some people might not want to do any of that that day. If you don't want to, sleep late, go to the spa, go back to the Medina, you know, we'll we'll have other suggestions that you might want to do. Aziz will be able to get you <laughs> in that van, and he'll take you. So, uh, and then, you know, uh, that night, we'll have our farewell dinner in the hotel tent. So, uh, that's really, that's that's a tour. It's basically six nights at the at Dar Annie Wynn. Uh, you know, I said it was nine nights to uh, nine days, but you have to, you have your travel yeah. days in there. All those tours, English speaking guide, uh, and of course your private uh, airport transfers to and from f- from the airport. No airfare, no gratuities, uh, and just a couple of meals. So you'll be free to choose yourself, and uh, also the travel insurance, which we highly recommend. Now, for this particular trip, we don't have one price. It's a little bit funny the way we had to price it because, 
at the uh, Riyadh, they have different types of rooms. Uh-huh. So the base cost of these rooms are different. So the price of the uh, the tour will range from three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars to three thousand seven hundred and fifty. Now, though three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars, you're going to stay in a royal suite. I mean, it is like fab, okay. <laughs> And and the the least expensive is called the classic room, I think. And then you have junior suite and a premium suite. So it's really first come first serve, in in what the pricing is. But it's not that much variance. And yeah, it wasn't as much as I thought it was going to be. No, no, it's not. And you won't be sad you spent the extra money, or if you were lucky to get a lesser room because you want didn't want to spend the money more money. Uh, it It's all wonderful. This place is really one of my favorite places I've ever stayed in the whole world because I love the owner, the service there, and, and the, the building and the grounds are fabulous. They're so unique. And it's just got this magic there. I'm so thrilled to be able to offer this. And so I think that's, it's such a good deal. I mean, I, this this trip it's probably the value of it seriously is is approaching six thousand sixty two hundred I mean, I'm not just saying this, but the what I put in here very much so we we're coming to the end gang, you know, I really do think both of the trips are super they've got great itineraries uh, I'm sorry before we go on, did we say the dates of the Marrakesh? The Marrakesh was November the thirtieth through the uh Eighth of December. Oh, so just right after Thanksgiving for us, us in the U.S. Here, great. Yeah, and it's a really good time to travel to Marrakesh because it's not hot, and it's not totally the the holiday season yet. So it's good. Yeah, it's a perfect. good time. Okay, so we're we're closing in here. So yeah, so you know, both of the trips I think have super itineraries. They're both focus on rich cultures in two totally unique destinations. Both places are very stimulating to the senses. They're and they're super interesting, and and like I said before, they're they're perfect ways for solo traveler who is a little hesitant or totally hesitant to travel to these destinations totally alone to get to experience them, and in a small group, not with all these people. I think it's just absolutely spot on the way you should do it. You know, and remember, what makes the Astrid Travel Club trips different, like I said, small groups, no single supplement, no shared uh, accommodations. They're luxury, but they don't break the bank. They're affordably priced. Itineraries with flair. That's what people always tell me, that my itineraries, they just they, they, there's just something about them that, you know, just makes things come alive and they just have so much flair. Hashtag Astrid Flair. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And lots of ample free time that you can do whatever you want. And like I said in some of uh, the show, if some of these activities on the itinerary, you don't want to do it. Oh, th- we have other suggestions you can do. And the hotel concierge can work it out for you. We can, we can figure out to, how to make it happen. So. You know, free time, itineraries with flair, and a lot of fun. Okay. How can people join? Basically, I was going to say, this is the only thing left, is how can people join? <laughs> okay. This is how you do it. Very easy. First of all, you go to my website, astridtravel.com. Easy to remember. You click on uh, the Astrid Travel Club tab. You see all the information about the club, the uh, two upcoming trips, then you can fill out the registration forms, use your credit or debit card. Easy. No fuss, no muss. That's all <laughs> you have to do. That's it, Catherine. You know, uh, basically, unless you have any more questions, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've touched on everything. But I could go on and on and on about a lot of the things that I am excited that I'm going to may come to fruition uh, in in the future. And I, I really do hope this uh, becomes uh, everything that uh, I envision it to be and dream it to be, because I know it's going to be a, just a wonderful 
vehicle for a lot of people to to see the world and to experience uh, things that they read about or they see on television that they don't quite know how to do it or their reservations, either price or just the way it's done. So I really hope this does great. I really do. Yeah. And not because of me, because uh, I think it's the right way to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny when you were telling me originally about the uh, the Astro Travel Club, I was thinking it's kind of like the Soul Travel Talk podcast in real life. <laughs> That's what I well, was. Gonna... But this is this is kind of what yeah. I was thinking. You know, in the end, I'll end the broadcast by saying I'm so excited and delighted to offer yeah. the Astro Travel Club membership to luxury minded solo travelers who just love to travel who love different cultural experiences, who love adventure, who are curious, who love to meet new and interesting people, and who sometimes turn into longtime friends. Because this really describes me as a traveler. And this is the way I have of giving back Mm. to, uh, you know, in in creating this, this vehicle for other solo travelers to have the opportunity, like I said, to expand themselves, to enrich their lives, and to have some fun uh, while in a small group of like-minded travelers. Because travel has changed my life for the better. So I invite you to join the Astrid Travel Club. It will change your life for the better. Listeners, I think that by now you understand the mindset drive that comes into the Astrid Travel Club. And if if this is right for you, I will include the links in the show notes for this episode so that you can click right through and become a member yourself. And of course, as Astrid mentioned, there are two trips that are planned relatively soon. So if those trips resonated with you you, and you're ready to make, yeah, you need to make a decision quickly, but that's why we're talking about it right now. Yeah, and, and, you know, if you have any questions or reservations or anything, just, you know, email us. We'll answer them. Um, we are here for you. Yes, yeah. we're not we're not hiding. You can you can reach out to us for sure. Yeah, but we wanted to offer two trips in uh, 2019, you know, once we launched, just to show that, you know, we're not just launching a club. I mean, we already have two trips in mind, and we're, you know, we are uh, going to launch or, or advertise the next trips within the next month. So, And listeners to this episode got a little treat for maybe some of the things that are coming in next year in 2020. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify. We love Spotify. Any of the fine places that you can find podcasts. Of course, you can also go to astridtravel.com slash podcast for Astrid's entire catalog of podcast episodes because we're not we know you're going to be there anyway because you're going to be checking out the club so just click over to the podcast tab as well just to say hello and yes. oh yes. and Catherine you, we have to always say this because this is what they tell us to do our with. podcast o- <laughs> algorithm overlords yes go ahead <laughs> yes. If you have benefited from this episode or you've liked what you've heard Give us a thumbs up and a share. If you have any questions about the Astrid Travel Club or about any of the trips or any question on solo travel, give us what you're thinking in the comments below. We do read these comments. We value them. They actually have helped us in our programming. Mm. So, you know, any questions, any comments, feel free to comment. And then the last and definitely the most important is subscribe to Solo Travel Talk. Because when you subscribe, that pushes out our broadcast to a larger audience all over the world. And they can have the benefit to decide whether they want to join the Astrid Travel Club or they want to listen to more podcasts, etc. So we appreciate it a lot. And it's really helping give other uh, potential solo travelers the opportunity for new ideas and, and, and new experiences. Well said, Astrid. We thank you all for listening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Solo Travel Talk. Find Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. All things Astrid, including the Astrid Travel Club and this podcast, are available at astridtravel.com.
Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. <laughs>